So, okay, this one was recommended. This is Eric Dotson. I've seen him around YouTube a few times. Sometimes I like what I see and sometimes I'm not sure what I'm watching or if I'm experiencing like having a different relationship with his content than other people. Um, I've heard mixed feelings about him, um, but also some really great things about him. So let's go ahead and check him out. This was recommended by someone on my Discord. Uh, if you guys want, I have a video tab on my Discord helps fund the channel that um, lets me go through content to watch later with you guys. So I've got a couple of videos already on my list. Okay, let's go ahead and start this one. This is called Wisdom and the Depth of Life. And wisdom is such a... Whoa, that's a loud audio. Let me know how it was audio. It's a rare and elusive thing in this world. So well, loud, in this right? video, I'd like to explore that question, especially with respect to what I call the dimensionality of life as we know. Sorry, let's start again. Because I'm not sure what bubble he's from. Uh, but when I watch him, sometimes I get mixed feelings. Okay, so have you ever wondered why genuine wisdom is such a rare and elusive thing in this world? Well, in this video, I'd like to explore that question, especially with respect to what I call the dimensionality of life as we know it. But before going into all of that, I should probably give a little credit where credit is due. And so I'd like to thank a local colleague of mine named Rick Chambers for encouraging me to make this video. So, little tip of the invisible chapeau to you, Rick Chambers. Anyhow, as I was saying in my last video, it seems to me that a fairly large fraction of our lives plays out across a two-dimensional space that's defined, naturally enough, by two axes. One of those axes runs between productivity and consumption, and the other oh. between entertainment. Hold on, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize he was going to put things on the screen. So I... I didn't actually give you guys the ability to see what he has on the screen. Oh, it's a little tiny on my screen. That's a bummer. And boredom. So, okay. Entertainment, happiness. So I'll just tell you what the graph, graph says. Entertainment slash happiness. Example on the left, being satisfied as a consumer. Example on the right, example being satisfied with your job and career. Example on the bottom left, consumption. Example being dissatisfied as a, cus a consumer. Production on the right hand side, example being dissatisfied with your job or career, and that's boredom unhappiness. So it's a entertainment slash happiness between boredom and happiness. I hope that made sense. In other words, a lot of our lives has to do with moving between being a producer who's working a job and being a consumer who's spending money. And at the same time, a lot of it has to do with trying to feel like we're entertained and happy rather than bored and unhappy. So basically, a pretty large fraction of our lives is about moving within the four quadrants of that two-dimensional space, oscillating between production and... Con Wait, did he say Rick Sanchez like Rick and Morty? Or like, isn't that Rick's name on Rick and Morty? Or is it Rick... Rick... Wait, what is it? I think... Wait, is this a joke? Or no, is he serious about Rick and Morty? Consumption on one hand... I thought it was just a random guy named Rick Sanchez. Is this a joke? <laughs> and between entertainment and boredom on the other. And for those of us who are thoroughly inured to it, living in that kind of flattened out world probably doesn't seem too bad. As long as we can make it through the work week, pay our bills, and binge watch a show or two on Netflix, well, life seems pretty good. Yeah, As the old good. song from the 1980s puts it, everybody's working for the weekend, which is Ooh, probably boy. emblematic of that kind of modus mm. vivendi. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. for some of us, things don't really work that way, mostly because. Oh, OK. We are memeing. OK, you guys are memeing in the chat because I was like, did he say Rick Sanchez? Oh, my brain. Anyways, OK, scratch that. It seems really, really obvious that there's also a depth dimension to our lives and probably higher order dimensions, too. And the most important thing is to experience the greater depth of life as often and as powerfully as we can. But the depth of life as often and the most important thing is to experience the greater depth of life as often and as powerfully as we can. I don't again, I don't like the idea that we should do anything because why? We're just here on a fucking planet. But if you want to know, if you want to have a deeper relationship with existence and existing, then I do think you have to ponder and I think you have to seek wisdom and I think you have to have those conversations. I'm not even high yet, guys. Give me an hour and I'm going to be baked. But 
I think this is the problem with even like the way he's saying it. Like, I, it's hard. I really I'm not trying to be like a relativist. That's not my goal. I have very strong opinions, but my goal is to acknowledge that because I think we're evolved animals on a planet, it's very hard for me then to justify this idea of who should do what and what should happen. Does that make sense? But what does that depth dimension look like? Well, consider our spiritual or religious experiences. Those incredible moments when we feel the breath of divinity moving through us. When we feel like we're one with the cosmos, or maybe with all of life, or, or maybe we're in communion with God, when everything suddenly becomes radiant and poetic and sacred, including even our own souls. Mm -hmm. For some of us, those are the kinds of experiences that really matter, and that make sense of having to wade through all of life's daily flotsam and jetsam. And for those of us who cherish them, those experiences can even serve as the stars by which we navigate the storm-tossed seas of this world, mm -hmm. and can imbue our lives with meaning, coherence, direction, and power. Okay, base, base, base. Um, so it says I tried LSD like three times and had no death, no deep experiences. Colors just look cool. I don't know. I will tell you this right now. Not everybody needs uh, an ego death through drugs. Like a lot of us can get an ego death in different ways. Like I think when life throws yourself like a really good curveball, it can give you an ego death. But if your goal is to have like a deep experience, it might not be drugs, people. It might be volunteering. It might be having a baby. It might be doing a lot of things. But that's how individual I know we are, even though we're categorizable. And I think there are lots of people like me who have ego deaths on drugs and deep experiences on drugs. Not every drug experience I'm having is a deep one. The one I'm about to do right now is just a fun one. I just want to get high. I want one piece later. I want to, you know what I mean? So again, I, I want people to be, you know how you meet those people? They're like, oh, everybody needs to do drugs. Not everybody needs to do drugs. Drugs are not going to give you a deep experience just because it's drugs. You are the product, my friends. You are the thing that the thing has to interact with. You know what I'm saying? However, just as the mathematical z-axis contains two regions extending into mm. infinite space, so too does the depth axis of life. And so, it's in audio, addition to the spiritual weird, side yeah. of life's depth, I'd say that the second region has to do with what the humanistic psychologist Abraham Maslow calls self-actualization. Mm -hmm. Basically, self-actualization involves recognizing and then living out our deepest possibilities in life. And ultimately, moving towards something like a powerful destiny as opposed to just drifting through life more or less mechanically and listlessly. Mm -hmm. Of course, self-actualization can take different forms for different people. Mm -hmm. After all, what is a powerful destiny for one person? can easily turn out to be a fruitless waste of time for another. But for all of us, self-actualization means awakening to a kind of power hidden within the deepest recesses of our being. It means, it means learning to be true to ourselves, not only true to what we are, but true to what we can be in this life. True to the strange and singular nexus of possibility that would constitute our first and best destiny. So on one side of the z-axis, I'd place spiritual and religious experience. And on the other side, I'd place self-actualization and authenticity. <laughs> However, I'd also say that in the culture of the United States, which is where I live, experiences in those areas seem relatively rare, especially in comparison to how much time we spend dwelling within the two-dimensional space defined by production and consumption on one hand, and by entertainment and boredom on the other. I don't know why I don't like the word dimension because then it just sounds I know there's like a very logical literal way of talking about the world dimension word dimension but then there's sort of like a woo woo way of talking about dimension that I don't like. I don't like to look at life like it's magical. I want to look at life like it's really really real. Like this is real life and it's happening but it's happening because it's in our heads and it's happening because it's outside of our heads. So like your survivability uh, like bre uh, food water shelter the basics. That is, I guess, his two-dimensional. And then everything after that, I guess, would be like the fourth dimension, question mark. So it's interesting how we word these things. Like I use bubbles or the levels. I'm just trying to explain like the relationship we're having with existing and existence. 
I think it's fine if you just have it with Netflix. I think it's fine if you live a normal life and you want to come home and just fucking chill. I think that's fine. I think most lifestyles are kind of fine, even though I wouldn't do 99.9% of them because I'm not you. Most of the ways people live are fine. Don't rape, don't steal, don't kill people. If you could do those three things, the world would be better. But we can't even do those things. And Daniel the Muslim even said he's not going to stop himself or the rule of Islam from killing gay people. So do I get rid of Islam? Or does Islam just change? But if Islam change, isn't that proof that Islam is fake? So then why do we let people believe in fake things? Because everything is fake. Our movies are fake. Our relationships are fake. Uh, half of us aren't even talking to our partners. Half of us lie to our partners. Half of us lie on our, or cheat on our partners. So what does it even mean when we're sitting here and pretending we have this great profound relationship with existence? And is it even profound to be a dog? Is it profound to be the lion? Is it profound to be the bear? I don't know. I think so spiritually. I think so in many ways because I think I'm great. But like, do I literally think that? I don't know about that. But at this point, the obvious question is probably, mm, okay, but why does all of that matter? What is its relevance to our lives, both individually and collectively? Well, the first answer would be that seeing things in terms of dimensionality starts to make sense of a lot of the vexing problems plaguing our world these days, despite all of our best efforts to solve them. For instance, Best efforts. It seems fairly obvious that we're continuing to have problems relating well to each other, which would include large-scale phenomena like war, genocide, and generalized oppression, as well as smaller-scale things like the bitterness and factionalism that runs through a lot of public discourse these days, at least in the United States. However, I'd say that we also have problems relating well to ourselves, which would include our penchant for self-sabotage, self-harm, our struggles with addictions of various sorts, as well as our chronic reluctance to assume direct personal responsibility for the quality of our lives. Mm. And finally, I'd say that we're having problems relating to our world more generally, which would include our ongoing degradation and destruction of the natural environment, as well as the fact that we've wired the entire planet for instantaneous nuclear obliteration. Either one of which could end up annihilating the biological basis for human existence. <laughs> Oopsie. <laughs> and it seems to me that all three of those very broad classes of problems share an important characteristic, which is that they're all rooted in our lack of wisdom. Basically, in the fact that while the human race has managed to acquire a fair amount of knowledge about the world, and has created some amazing technological advances as a consequence, we still haven't developed the wisdom to live well with what we know. At least That's true. not yet. But the thing that makes... Living well is hard. It is hard. Uh, I am still working on living in the present a lot more actively. And I'm... And I think when I'm living in the present, I'm usually living well because my life is pretty good. Um, obviously, we all have hardships and stuff, but I'm at the point in my life where if I lived more in the present, I think I'd be living more well. But man, when I'm like in chronic pain or I'm thinking about the anxieties of the future, my brain just pull myself into that like loophole. And then I have to remind myself like your present life is literally great. And it is. Um, but I'm also like when I'm it's it's hard because like things are happening around you but this is really good i like that mm, mm. makes wisdom living well is like i'm sorry i've been really what does it mean to live well it's like such a very specific it's such a specific vibe that's what i that's what i'm trying to say to people i think everyone can live well in their own bubbles but you have to live well and I don't think a lot of people are living well in their bubbles. I don't think fresh and fit are living well. I don't think um, they're having joyous lives. I don't. Even, I don't think a lot of my friends are living very well or in joyous lives. I think everyone is living. I just hear too much complaining for it to be a well life. You know what I'm saying? And it makes me wonder like what's going wrong. Like I know when I'm sick, I don't feel like I'm living the greatest life. And I'm like, what's happening? And then I have to rewire my brain to be okay with the fact that now I can't identify as a healthy person, which is very strange for me. It's like I'm having a cognitive dissonance with my existence, existing. 
But it's like a process and I can rationalize like how it's a process I have to go through to earn the wisdom because I'm not wise yet. I'm earning my wisdom right now. Life is giving me the tools to earn my wisdom. Um, and I think this is a part of it. You know what I mean? Some difficult for us is that it's usually born in the depth dimension, the dimension that we usually neglect in the realms of spirituality and self-actualization, rather than in the two-dimensional space of production, consumption, entertainment, and boredom. Yeah, I agree. In other words, in other words, in other words? the reason why we keep suffering from the same time-worn ailments year after year is that we've been trying to use two-dimensional logic to solve our world's three-dimensional problems. I agree. Hex I can't say your name, bro. Um, complaining is kind of fun sometimes, though. No, no, no. I am a professional complainer. I vent to my partner. I vent to the people in my inner circle. I want to vent to people who know I don't mean what I'm saying. Or they, I mean it sometimes. But, like, I love to vent. I love to complain. I love to gossip. It's healthy. It's good for you. As long as you're not being super, super, super malicious in your words, I think it's all just kind of fun. But I do try to pay attention to how I'm describing other people and if I mean it. Because like I said, I get along with mostly everybody on a surface level, which I think is asking a lot of me. But I do get along with most people. Um, but what, you know what I mean? Like, oh, anyways, I'm not going to go into it. Sorry. Also, I have like a thing in my tooth and I really want to get it out. And as long as we continue to do that, our world will. Ah, G baby says living well sounds boring. Give me that roller coaster type life. You and destiny should start fucking. This is the thing. If you are the kind of person who wants chaos in your life, and I know those people, I want to hear zero fucking complaints from you. I don't want to hear one goddamn complaint to the internet or anyone else. And you want me to care. I cannot be sympathetic towards Destiny anymore if he keeps inviting Lav into his life, right? I love my friend and he can be chaotic, but I'm not on board. My friends in my personal life who do these things, I love you all, but it's obviously a hot mess life and I don't want to hear any fucking complaining because the people who go, my life is wonderful, but I'm going to complain about it. The fuck? Like, don't get me wrong. I can complain about being sick. You can complain about things going wrong in your life. But if your life is just the way it is and you've orchestrated it and you're still complaining, there's something wrong. You know what I mean? And so I I definitely want to pay attention to like, are you complaining because something bad happened? Like if Stephen complains about any other crazy women who come into his life, it's like self-inflicted pain. And I can't really care at that point because it's like your life, right? But if you are a person who's never fucked with a crazy bitch before and it comes out of nowhere, then it's like, oh my God, are you okay? Because it's your first, second time, but not your fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth time. I mean, my God, you know what I mean? At that point, it's a lifestyle choice. And I don't care if you have problems because of it, because that's your choice, right? So yes, if you want chaos and you want crazy, you know what I'm saying? You do you, but I don't want no roller coaster. Never heal, life. at least not in any appreciable way. Ah, G Baby says, no, 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 God, no, please, no. I think I just mean I'm okay with having up and downs. Okay, life will automatically have ups and downs. Even when you create a well-lived life, life, because of existence, will give you ups and downs. People will go to war. The economy will crash. You'll lose your home in a flood. Don't worry. Life, even when you live it well, will have its natural ups and downs. Sure, we might occasionally be able to alleviate some of the symptoms of our world's malaise, which definitely has value, <clears throat> but will always fall short of curing its fundamental sickness, which is to say, curing our own sickness. Mm -hmm. But at this point, maybe I should talk a little about why living in a two-dimensional world isn't particularly conducive to cultivating the three-dimensional wisdom we desperately need. Ooh, desperately all, need? Do humans need it? Do humans, if we're evolved animals on a planet, do we need wisdom? Do we need to be better? Do we need to change? Why? Why? Because again, depending on why you think we're here on the planet, do we need to change? Now, I'm not criticizing Eric Dotson here of, um, do I know him? Why does he look like, oh, I almost know a man who looks like this in person. Have I met him and I didn't even realize it? I don't know. Something about his face right now just made me realize, like, I feel like I know this man, but I know him from YouTube. Okay. Is the stream lagging a bit? Ooh. There is going to be like a delay because of the way I stream. But anyways, um, 
do like again his channel might be geared to talking to people who want to change so it doesn't matter but do is there like a I don't have that like that thing in the back of my head oh the stream is lagging a bit and it's buffering no hold on YouTube isn't receiving enough information lagging and choppy okay hold on it might just be my internet um yeah it's it says it's a mess okay am i back is it okay now okay i think i'm backish okay so the reason I asked this question, please tell me if I'm still fucked up. The reason I asked this question about the why is because I can't start to ask the world to change unless I give them the reason why. And I don't have a reason why. I cannot come up with a reason to ask 8 billion people to change. Do you guys get what I'm saying? So when somebody comes to you and says like, we should encourage people to be different, they're saying that they must have some sort of reason to have people change. Does that make sense? I just don't have any reason to tell people to change. After all, isn't it theoretically possible to glean wisdom from life's most insignificant details? To see the world in a grain of sand, like I'm Blake sorry, once so said, or to realize like, that hmm. everything holds the secret, as Abraham Heschel once proclaimed. And yes, I'd agree that it's very definitely possible. But in practical terms, <laughs> That's a pretty tall order for most of us, mostly because our everyday two-dimensional world has a way of constantly deflecting our attention elsewhere, toward, toward buying a shiny new cell phone, for instance, or maybe toward ogling the Kardashian. The problem, oh, he sounds just like me, but the problem is the difference between how he talks and I talk is I don't want you to change by force. I want you to either go on this journey or not go on this journey because I don't want to control you. I'm sick of everyone trying to control everybody. You know what I mean? I don't want to tell you not to live your life, but yes, there are different ways to exist. If you want to have a deeper relationship with yourself or existing or existence and you want to find the path that's going to make sense to you, that's a journey that takes time. That could even mean being poor. You know what I mean? Because there's not a lot of money in existential dread and exploration. And also we're all seeking different things. Like, I know I'm on this journey of wisdom. Some people would argue that we're all wise because we do wise things every day. I feel like the wisdom I'm seeking is a greater relationship with the self in existence that I don't think I'll earn until maybe I die, right? Maybe even after. So it's one of those things where your beliefs will inform your version of introspection or enlightenment or actualization. And then, you know, you're, you're going to have a different relationship with it than other people. But again, this is like what I have been trying to explain. Like, yes, there's the basics. There's the bubbles that give you the basic script. Like, hey, you're Catholic now. Be Catholic. Hey, you're Muslim. Be Muslim. But again, if you question it and move outside the bubble, you're pushed out and ostracized as somebody who's lost, a heathen, something different, which for me says that it's not objective because I feel like objective truth would be less fearful of humans in general and what we're doing here on the planet because everything should be the way it is. If you believe in God, then you should have the confidence in God to do right by the people. And you should live, live and let live and let people make their own choices in relation to God. If God is about free will in the Catholic faith and you have to come to God freely, then you shouldn't be upset that people are trans. It just doesn't make sense, right? So it's like all of these relationships we're having with these things are going to be dependent on your belief of why you think you're here on the planet. And then whether or not you need to seek a deeper understanding. Because again, if you decide that no matter what information you get, God has to still exist, well, then you can't go on this journey. Even though I don't know if God exists, the point was is that I, you have to be willing to lose him in order to really know him if he exists objectively. I've never met a God, but you know. Since they take endless selfies of their own asses. Or maybe, <laughs> maybe toward ogling. So if says is, is the Britney bubble, the don't tell anyone what to do bubble low key, only if they ask. If you ask me, I'll tell you what to do. If you don't ask me and I don't get your consent to lecture you, not my business. You do you, bitch. But yes, if ultimately, if you come to me, I'm I'm not here. Like, you know what I mean? I'm not going to fight, fight to the dinner table, you know. But if if you come to me and you're like, hey, what would you do differently if you were me? 
I could say, well, if I was you literally, I would do this because I think it would facilitate your joy. Or I could say, if you were me, you would do this. Pulling the Kardashian asses on our shiny new cell phones. <laughs> Ooh, After wait. all, what are our advanced technologies for, if not that? The CBLs are crazy, bro. In essence, the problem with a two-dimensional world is that it operates mostly according to the logic of seduction and addiction rather than wisdom. Not only addiction in its most literal and physical sense, which is troublesome enough, but more importantly, addiction to figurative intoxicants like distraction, entertainment, mm -hmm and the never-ending enticements of commodity culture. And most of all, addiction to our own overweening self-importance, which as I like to say, pretty much makes crystal meth look like chamomile tea. I mean. But what really makes all of that important is the fact that moving from a paradigm of seduction and addiction to one of actual wisdom is actually humanity's primary evolutionary struggle at this point in history. Part and parcel of the whole overarching question of where we are and where we're going and why it's worth going there in the first place. And a big part of that evolutionary struggle has to do with recognizing that living in a two-dimensional world like ours isn't very commensurate with the actual depth of our souls, which is the locus of wisdom in the first place. Do you guys agree that evolutionarily speaking, we are on a trajectory for more introspective interaction? I think that we are technically uh, in, the, in the very macro way, but I think it's such a slow process that it's almost meaningless in some ways. I also, I don't know... I don't know. What's his name? We're watching Eric Dotson, Wisdom and the Depth of Life. It was recommended on my Discord. I don't know if I know that it's the next evolutionary goal because I think like bubbles give birth to new babies. Like if Islam is going to be the number one religion by 2100 allegedly, then obviously humans aren't going in a direction of introspection and higher understanding of existence because they're blindly following a god they've never met, right? And if those people are going to have more babies and those babies will give birth to more Muslims, which are just religious people, then I think religion is the proof that we are not probably heading in that direction. But secularism, let's say the world was all secular, that is also not proof that we're heading in the better direction. So I'm not really convinced that most people aren't just doing their best and they're living pretty basic lives and then we'll all die. And I wouldn't argue that my life is much more than the basic life either because the introspective actualization I've had with my existence impacts me and some of the people around me. But it really doesn't matter except for me, which is why when I talk about the levels or the bubbles or anything, I'm really here to help individuals make peace with their existing and existence. So I'm not, I'm not sure that it is part of evolution, but I think that it's a nice idea and I, I just – I don't like this idea because look, even if we get past, like he mentioned, even if we get past sort of the basics, let's say everyone is fed, everyone has a house and everyone's happy in that regard. All the basics are met. Great. What about people that are petty? What about people that are kind of negative? What about people that are pessimistic? Like yes, those things might dwindle or go away over time if you're more actualized. But some people aren't going to be able to do that for a lot of reasons. So humanity as a whole will always have people who just decide to go in a different direction. And I don't want to stop them from doing that. And I also don't want to pretend like I know that this is the direction we're heading into. Because even though it'd be a great idea, hey, maybe if we were all self-actualized in a better way or a little bit more of a way, we would stop doing these self-fulfilling sabotage problems, right? What is, like, but at the same time, like, who am I to say you shouldn't live that destructive life? Like, you do you. But do I think it has joy in it? No. Do I think all of humanity can experience joy at the same time? No. Because everyone's going to be giving birth to new babies and new babies are going to make their own decisions unless you force them to be self-actualized in school, which ends up just turning turning into like a new doctrine, right? Maybe that's how my brain thinks about it. What about you guys? Gabriel says, aren't the more people, there are more people giving up on religion than before? Uh... Yes, but what are they replacing it with? Are they replacing it with seeking of wisdom? Or are they replacing it with what? Just because they're not religious doesn't mean we're getting any more self-actualized, right? In essence, we've created a world that doesn't fit us very well, at least not at the level of our innermost being. 
And sure, maybe we can grit our teeth and tolerate living an unwise, soulless life for a while. And we might even be able to eke out an entire lifetime that way. But that doesn't necessarily mean that our existence is being consummated at any point. And maybe it's just me, but I suspect that I suspect that that's what we human beings really want, to consummate our time in this world, to bring our existence to its fullest and most sublime point, preferably more often rather than less often. In other words, I have no reason to think people want that on a mass scale. Like I've never seen evidence of this. I think this is projection of assuming people would want this. I don't think people want this. One of the reasons I'm moving towards the radical acceptance bubble more and more is because literally I meet people every, why does Steven keep talking to love? If Steven want to joy in his life, peace in his life, cohesive, like existing, why did he get so offended when Abba had that conversation about hedonism with him and Melina? We don't want, we don't want a peaceful life. People, some people want chaos. Some people want drama and toxicity. And I'm not here to tell my friend not to seek out his version of what he thinks is joy. Do I think it's real joy? No. Do I think it is perceived happiness? Um, sure. Yeah. In other words, and I don't think they're bad people for doing it. I just think that that that's like what they want to do. Beneath the seething maelstrom of all of our more superficial and transient desires, I suspect that there's an abiding kind of hunger, a kind of secret ravenousness to experience the real depth of life, to feel its miraculous charm passing through us, just like our breath, to feel it as something palpable and intimate and undeniably real. So if said Stephen does not want peace, he wants problems. Stephen wants a challenge. And because he only knows how to challenge himself within the bubble he thrives in, he's not satisfied because the bubble's boring as hell. But that's the thing is like he is constructing this bubble. There are more interesting bubbles and different ways to challenge yourself. What if he started watching philosophy videos, like actually philosophy lectures, like from Verveke, or even talking about wisdom, or even talking about, but that's not interesting. That's not what people generally want. They want the drama. He said, quote, lav is great entertainment, right? Like lav is great content. If lav is good content, only if you're a drama streamer. <laughs> so like, yes, if Steven wants drama, he's allowed to be a drama streamer. But I think that's interesting how he went from a political streamer and somebody who was like, you know what I mean? To like more of a drama streamer. But then he's getting into politics too. Look, I'm not here to criticize him. Like, that's what I'm trying to say to you too. He should do what he wants to do. But would I recommend people choose his lifestyle? No. But I also wouldn't recommend people choose a lot of people's lifestyles because it's not because Steven's so good at it, but because Steven's so bad at it that I don't want people to think that it's always going to be this bad for them or bad by my definition, obviously. Bad by my definition. Because again, if you're running a business, you want less headaches than more headaches. And Steven's run is too many headaches for the year. So my brain, you know what I'm saying? Like my brain is very specific. I really don't want Steven to see this and be like, Brittany, Brittany hates me. I don't fucking care what you do with your life. But obviously I wouldn't recommend it to people because I don't, I think they're going to think it's that messy all the time. You can do open relationships and have it 99% less messy. But if all of that's true, then the obvious question is probably, okay, but what's standing in our way? Why is it that most of us don't experience that sort of thing a lot more often? So at this point, let's take a look at what I see as four significant obstacles to experiencing the greater depth of life and developing a little wisdom along the way, and hence furthering humanity's evolutionary process. The first of those would have to do with the historical inertia of our prevailing cultural practices, especially here in the West. Basically, we continue to tolerate a two-dimensional world, partly because most of us don't expect anything better. True. In True. essence, we're used to setting our sights way too low, mostly because, <laughs> well, because that's what we've been taught. And, and it works. You're born into a bubble. You stay in a bubble. Um, but see, okay, again, I just, in case you're just chiming in, 
He is pushing you in a direction and I'm saying you have no obligation for this direction. But yes, you're born into a bubble and then you live in the bubble and then you assume there's no other way to exist. You remember when Steven on stream was like, no shot, Bernice, people thought you were trans. And I'm like looking at him and I'm like, you can't even imagine that someone else is having like a different experience with reality. And that's so strange, right? Because he's so interesting in so many ways. But once we've decided that there's no shot, something is ex being experienced by someone else, we've decided that there is nothing to pop. There is no bubble to pop. There's no reality to have a relationship with. There's no way to question ourselves. The moment you've decided that's not how, there's no happy trans kids, you have decided, bam, even saying there's no God is kind of insane or saying there is a God is kind of insane. Because again, unless you've had a relationship with this, mm, and it's the same thing with drag queens. Some drag queens will be inappropriate based off of your standard and value, even mine. And some of them won't be. Some of them will be sexual and some of them won't be. They're, you know what I'm saying? But until you are open to that, then what's wrong with your regular life? You get up, you come home, or you get up, you go to work, you come home. It's a pretty good life. Most people live pretty good lives. Basically, there's a struggle and there's ups and downs. But I think it's not about money or class or status, though I think that plays a role in the two dimension part. His language, using his language, the four dimension part is really without those things. Listen to me when I say this. Sneeko is playing a two dimensional game, but I want him to play the four dimensional game if he wants to. And I think he will in about 10 years. And I'm using his language to explain it. But basically, Sneeko is choosing a bubble and playing the games of the twos. He's questioning the bubble, but he's not questioning his bubble. And that's the problem. Every bubble you land into will have biases and misinformation. Even Britney's bubble, which I've orchestrated and curated for myself, will have flaws and mistakes in it because I'm not a wise or perfect person. And that is the struggle is knowing that. So you can't get on YouTube or Twitter or TikTok and be like, this is what people should do, which sells and makes views. As a content creator, trust me, as a smaller channel, it is difficult making views when your views are, how can I help everyone be their joyous self? The money comes in though, because I like market myself around the loophole of that two-dimensional bubble. But with Sneeko's bubble, he can't market himself outside of the views. And so he has to market a product. So he has like a kit, which apparently my viewers have gotten and said is pretty good. And then on top of that, you have like the shtick he's doing, which fuels his two-dimensional money wallet. So I gave up money to get what I thought was introspection and wisdom. I would have given that advice to Sneeko. But Sneeko chose to play the two-dimensional game and make his wallet full. And then I think he's going to play four-dimensional. But again, I don't know. He could make a different decision. But of course, if you really are going around saying the things Sneeko's saying, you're not really saying anything. You're just mimicking and parroting, which is fine because it's a part of the shtick. That's how people know if you're safe, right? If you're in a progressive bubble and you hear someone misgender someone, doesn't that make you go, can't trust that person? And then if you're in a conservative bubble and you hear somebody trans, uh, uh, gender someone correctly, like a trans person correctly, then it's like a red flag of, ooh, you're one of those softy progressives. We are always looking for the way, we're always looking for our people. And if we're always only comforted by our people, then, and that's fine, of course we wouldn't leave the bubble. So yeah, his number one is on top of it, but I don't want to cast judgment on it. I want to say that makes sense for you and I hope it leads you to some sort of joy. And that's what everyone else is doing too. And it's been that way for as long as anyone can remember. And so anything that deviates from that historically ingrained pattern, anything that seems truly resonant and deep and wise naturally feels weird, foreign, and maybe even a little scary. And so it's easy to react negatively to it. An example. Let's see if we can think of an example. Has it ever struck you as odd how historical personages who seem to be bearers of life's greater wisdom often end up being killed off by the people around them and fairly frequently while they're still young? Not all of those people, to be sure, but a lot more than chance alone would permit. For instance, consider the cases of Socrates, Jesus, Abraham Lincoln, Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., etc. Do you suppose that that's just some sort of weird coincidence? <laughs> Ooh, this is, this is, see, my brain doesn't do this. My brain doesn't do this. So, uh, I hate this argument. But is he making the argument because he knows it will make sense to the bubbles? 
Or is he making an argument of how he thinks? Because Martin Luther King Jr. had his flaws. All these people had their flaws. Was Jesus God or was Jesus just a madman who was convincing people he was the son of God? Was Martin Luther King Jr. not someone who lied on his dissertation and stole it? Was, you know what I'm saying? Like, was he also not having an affair and cheating on his wife? That fucking bitch. But were they also not amazing people who moved the world forward? Like, that's the question. See, oh, he's doing it. Oh, I don't like that he's doing this. He's pedestooling the concept that these are, like, look, I'm afraid of the mob as much as anyone else, but the mob kills everybody, not just, like, wise people. And the mob doesn't kill wise people because they can't handle it. The mob kills wise people because they don't like it, which is like the same thing, but not like. I, I don't like it. Uh, personally, I'd say probably not. And so the first obstacle would have to do with our habitual cultural practices, which often run counter to cultivating wisdom and experiencing the depth of life. But beyond that, it seems to me that institutionalized power also plays an important role. Basically, it's not in power's interest to let us perceive things too deeply or... Who is... No, this is so conspiracy! I think this is why I stopped watching this guy. It's... This is a conspiracy. This is a bubble. Like, he's saying the powers that be. Who are, who? People, us, 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 who? Again, 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 again. It doesn't benefit the powers at be to allow you to be introspective because they're not introspective. They just want your fucking money. Like, oh my God. Like, I hate this argument. I was having so much fun with this video and now I don't care. Because again, once the argument becomes somebody scary over there is trying to control me, where is the wisdom in that? Where is the wisdom in saying, yeah, dude, uh, masses of people give select people power because they fucking don't want the responsibility. And then we complain that the guys who we gave power to don't do it the way we like it. And then we want the government to be transparent to the American people. But if they tell us their secrets, are they telling the world their secrets? And we have enemies. And so it's not like Biden can get on fucking TV and be like, the American people. Here are all our nuclear codes. It's like, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, the American government, as an example, cannot get on national television to let us all know the deep secrets of our government because then everybody in the world knows. Okay. And so no longer superpower. And at the same time, we're upset that people in power are like lying to us. But like, why? When literally, what other option do you want them to take? Oh, I want a really transparent government who tells their people everything. Cool. Find me a parent who's like that. Find me a partner who's like that. Find me enough people who do these things. And then we can talk about the government doing that too. It's like the government is a reflection of us. Like even using Jesus as the example, who crucified Jesus? It wasn't Pontius Pilate. It was the Jews. Pontius Pilate didn't even want to crucify Jesus. He's like, what the fuck are you doing on my stage, you whore? You know what I'm saying? And then the Jews made the decision. What are these powers that be? To become genuinely wise, because if we did... Same Monet says, when content leans conspiratorial, I disconnect so quick. Literally, I've disconnected. Then we might also begin to perceive how silly and cloddish our world's power games really are. And that's the last thing that institutionalized power wants. <laughs> it doesn't want us to become perceptive enough or smart enough or wise enough to start questioning it in any serious way or to begin orienting ourselves toward things that lie beyond its purview or... <laughs> God forbid, to stop taking it seriously altogether. An example. Wait, I saw a comment. Uh, okay, hold on. Salty Doggo says, right, but MLK Jr. wasn't killed for cheating on his wife. I think that's the point. He wasn't killed for telling the truth. Power and How do we know why he was killed? Like, you know, when someone does something, you're like, why would they do that? And the power, money, politics, was it personal? Was it not personal? You know what I'm saying? When people die, why was JFK shot? We don't know. So when we have these conversations, we want to believe the narrative that was given to us. But again, the conversation that needs to be had is, do we really know why things happen? My father and fought with his siblings, right? They all had a fight. And my uncles are great. My aunties are great. And I wish they would all get the fuck along, even though I think some of them got poor piss attitudes. 
But I understand that everyone's got a poor piss attitude, so whatever. Why can't these adult people just get along? Why can't they move past their differences? Because the belief is so strong. The ego is so strong, they can't move past it. And they can't see each other. So they can't communicate. If you can't communicate to people, even people you love the most, and they can't see you. I spit on my mic. What Do you know what I'm saying? Biden, Trump, you are never going to let the other side. You're never going to trust them. What if Trump came out and actually was like the best president in the world? Do you think that would matter? What if Biden came out and actually was the best president in the world? But then what does that mean to be the best president? Is that even possible in the way the world is? So again, these like theories about how like the elites are taking over or there's bad people who are trying to convince us of something. Again, if Andrew Tate is playing a character, then he is just as bad as the politicians you complain about. You should crucify him if you're a fan of Andrew Tate and you find out he's playing a character, you should crucify him because he never said that before. And if Sneeko's playing a character, which I think he is, now he's never, I think, denied that he's playing a character. I'd have to ask him. But Sneeko also, like, Andrew Tate wasn't playing a character up until this point. And now that he's threatened with jail, he's playing a character. It's like, okay, if we can use the law like Fox News does when they get into court and they're like, we're entertainment, we're not news. What is this loophole go- game we're all playing with each other? So Fox News isn't really news. It's entertainment when it matters. That's what I'm saying. None of you stick to values. None of you are willing to die for your causes, which is why in some ways you got to give props to the religious. Not only are they willing to blow themselves up, they're willing to take a gun to the head for their religion. But who put them in a situation where they even had to do that in the first place? Just humans. Like, if you're a king, do you not want power? If you're an independent, don't you want power? If you're just a person, don't you want power? And hopefully you wouldn't abuse that power. But how many times in the last 10 years have you maybe told a lie you're ashamed of? Or tricked people? Or even stolen and you're ashamed of it? Look, I'm not going to crucify people for being flawed. But I'm also not going to sell to the masses some illusion that if we just, if we just tackled the powers that be, look at this man, this beautiful man, this nice man, Eric, who just said we are responsible for our self-actualization and then uses the institutional power as the reason why we might not have it. Now, he is making a case for a partial reason. So let's keep watching before we prejudge too hard. Ends up structuring the institution of education pretty much along those lines in a way where wisdom almost never appears among its primary goals, mostly because it seems irrelevant to the more immediate task of producing competent workers who can fuel the engine of production and consumption. To paraphrase the great comedian George Carlin, what power wants is obedient workers no what helps run a good society is obedient workers what keeps a society going is is good jobs for for people look i meet so many people who are given opportunities to do to be something specific but you know what people want they want good jobs and they want to come home do i think we could have a society that actually does have factories that are good work and have good workers and yes it's factory work so you're thinking it's not that great but maybe we could create a society where being a factory worker being a good worker is actually for the benefit of society and it matches your personality because look not all of us are rebellious artists not all of us want to be youtubers some of us do just want to go to a nine to five and come home that's great that's fucking awesome that's a skill i wish i had sometimes i wish i could just have a nine to five and not want to die But most people who have that, they're really great and happy people. And I love that for them. Now, should they get paid more? And should they get benefits that are better? And vacation times every maybe three months? Yeah, I think we should. I think in an ideal world, we would have a working force that didn't have to be slaves to a government because the government was just interested in creating a wealthy and perspos... Wait. Uh Uh-oh, the weed's hitting. Per... I can say it in my head, but I can't say it out loud. Anyways, we would want a government that would actually be invested in creating a good and profitable society by doing the best by its constituents. But of course, we can't even do that because we all have different beliefs about what that looks like. Like example, Dave Ramsey, who is a financial guy on YouTube. I'm getting high. The weed is hitting people. Disclaimer, disclaimer. Um, and yes, after this video, I will take calls. So if you go into my waiting room, I will pull you into my chat room and we will talk while I'm high. Um, 
prosperous. Thank you, Z King. You are amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Kai. Thank you, Kay. Thank you, everybody. Okay, yes. So Dave Ramsey fired somebody recently because he was like cheating on his wife. And he said, no, in this company, this is a Christian company, you can't cheat on your wife and keep your job. Now, in some ways, I think that's fucking badass. That is more feminist than I've ever seen a feminist. And that's a conservative doing it. Like Dave Ramsey, hate him or love him. A part of me is like, that's fucking awesome. And then another part of me is like, that's pretty fucked up. People make mistakes and people do bad things, but maybe they're the greatest worker you've ever had. Why are you firing them for cheating on their wife? But I think there's something to be said that there's a kind of cheater that also makes a bad employee. And then there's the kind of people that are good employees that cheat. So when I think about these situations and I think about, again, this idea of like the government just wants your attention and everybody wants to control you. Name one, name a bubble you're in where someone doesn't want to control how you talk, walk, think, pledge right? So again, if you're blaming the powers that be, the powers that be exist everywhere. If you're in a Catholic bubble, someone's trying to tell you how to live. If you're in a feminist bubble, someone's trying to tell you how to live. So again, I just want to know, I want to know what image people have in their head when they're like, the people in the power are controlling us. What does that mean? Seven says he did not care about the woman. Huh? Honestly, I think he cared about the integrity of his company and the integrity of his values. And of course, I think he cared about that woman because look, in certain conservative bubbles, like my bubble, getting cheated on is like, that is like hitting your wife. My father has never hit my mother and would never cheat on her. If my father hit my mother or cheated on her, it would be the same. It is the most, it is. That is who, huh? Like, you know what I'm saying? So again, I'm not saying that's the right answer because sometimes I think people cheat and it's not that, like everybody calm down. But also for some people, again, my partner and I, we're sticking it through no matter how hard this marriage gets, if it does get hard, except for the five or six things that are considered abuse in our bubbles, like in our bubble we constructed. And cheating is one of them. Cheating is, cheating is saying, divorce me now, I'm a piece of shit. But in some people's, it's not. Okay. Also, Clara, Habibi, please. No, Habitsi, please. I assume you're a girl. Listen, Clara, listen. I know you want me to take off my dress, but you need to sign up for my OnlyFans, girl. It is the place to be, girl. Sign up. I just posted the most amazing photo shoot, y'all. Honestly, I'm like obsessed with contrast right now, which I'm not saying it's good photography. I'm not a photographer, but my OnlyFans right now, I really like the photo shoot. It's being posted over the next like six days. I post like on a daily. So, or not on the daily, sorry. I always post the middle of the month and then I post whatever I've made, but I, I'm posting them. Anyways, it's really good. It's really great. I really fucking love it. And honestly, I feel really good about the way I look right now. I feel really like, I feel pretty again. I was so sick there for a second that I just felt like shit. And now I just feel pretty again, which is nice. And yeah, I think it's really coming through the photos. People who are just smart enough to run the machines and do the paperwork <sighs> and just dumb enough to passively accept it. And because institutionalized power tends to structure our values and our consciousness that way, I'd say that anyone who's willing to seek out the real depth of life, anyone who's willing to consummate his or her existence for any amount of time, is already in a state of rebellion, already militating against the status quo. And if all of that is starting to sound a little like your own life, Ow. well then... I okay, hold on. But what if I wanted to rebel against being actualized? What if I wanted to say, why should I be actualized? Maybe I should just live the life I'm living. Isn't that now, once again, I'm in a power of rebellion and I am once... Do you know what I'm saying? Everything you do is the right decision. Humans are going to human and it's okay do better, but take your time, but like do it now, right? Do better, love yourself, find your peace and joy. Take your time though, it doesn't matter, but like do it now, okay? Not to be such a rebel, but why should I want to be actualized? I'd say that you're already an agent of the infinite, whether you realize it or not. 
And if it doesn't sound much like your life, well. Okay, if you guys sign up for my OnlyFans, let me tell you what relationship we're about to have. You are about to see, well, first of all, how much I love being naked. I just like, when I move to Europe, I'm going to do naked cooking videos and stuff. I do like laundry videos, but listen to me when I say this. There's something so joyful about just being nude and comfortable in my body that I, I will never trade because I knew what journey I had to go on to get there. So if you want to fund my European move, my marriage, or just my bank account every day, and you want to see me naked, this is the place to see it because it is my favorite naked version of myself. Like all the times I was learning and everything, like this is the version of me that's like, dude, being naked is dope. It's like the best naked version of Britney, I feel. She's just so like, especially if you're learning to get comfortable with your body, you can skip the ones you're not comfortable with. But I think if you ever think about taking nude photos, I, that's why I sign up for girls only fans or boys only fans. I sign up for people's nude art because like, it just makes me, it just, I love being around naked people. There's something so freeing and so just like, but I don't usually, I don't call myself a real nudist because I don't want to live in the constraint of the bubble that is the nudist bubble, but just being naked it's so good. Well, you might start to wonder about how you really want to spend your time in this world. Remember that you are unique in the universe. There's only one of you, and there will never, ever be another. True. And your time in this land is actually very fleeting, all things considered. So, would you rather spend it constantly whirring like a well-oiled gear within the world's machinery? Or is your deeper desire to feel... Wait, what did I do? What did I do? Wait. Wait, what did I do? Am I being pranked? Boomer, how long do you think it will take for her to notice? <laughs> Wait, okay, the mic is unmuted. Two minutes. No! Wait, what happened? What happened? Wait. No, I feel like I'm being pranked. Am I just, am I not streaming right now? What am I missing? I'm gone? I'm not even streaming? Why? Did my internet cut off? Wait. It says I'm still streaming. Wait, my stream is gone? Wait, I see it. I think the stream buffed a bit. It's fine for me. No, it's working. Okay. Okay. It just fucked up for some people. I can see you. They're trolling. Oh my God. Okay. You froze for a second, but you're back. Okay. Refresh, refresh, refresh. The stream just ended? What is going on? It's all right now. Okay, hold up. Hold on. I see everyone leaving and coming back. Did my stream just completely crash? Where's my stream? Oh, my God. Okay. You froze for a second, but you're back. Okay, refresh, refresh, refresh. Oh, my God. My stream, stream is so ended? bad. What? I look crazy. I look like a pixelated alien. It's all right now. Okay, hold up. Hold on. I see everyone. Oh my God. My stream is so, stream. is it bad all okay, day? So God, I'm so fuzzy. I can't wait for good internet. When I'm in good internet, y'all, my streams are going to kill. Okay. You froze for a second, but you're back. That was crazy. I'm so sorry. Okay. Uh, if Len clips this part, we'll have to have him edit it a lot. Okay, I'm going to keep going because I want to get through some of these. Uh, and then if, it, okay, we have like, oh, we have some more time on this. Let's finish this video and then I'll pull people into calls and then we'll hopefully it will work. You'll like an ecstatically free agent of the infinite. And okay, I realize that it's a very personal question that undoubtedly has a very personal answer. But I'd also say that it's not a bad question, especially in a time and place like this. Anyhow, I'd say that a third and even bigger obstacle to developing wisdom has to do with a kind of paradox woven into its nature, and it goes like this. 
It would take wisdom to recognize that what we're lacking is wisdom. Similarly, it would take some sense of life's depth to recognize that we're living in a two-dimensional space in the first place. And because of those sorts of paradoxes, it's very easy for us just to keep grinding along in our mostly two-dimensional world and to continue bemoaning its perennial deficiencies when they appear on the nightly news. And finally, I'd say that a fourth impediment would have to do with an addiction that I mentioned earlier, namely our addiction to our own self-importance. After all, that's what keeps the human race stuck on the uppermost part of the Dunning-Kruger curve, thoroughly convinced that we know what we're doing, when in reality, we're many, many miles away from it. And from that lofty perch, it seems like we've already arrived, like we're already wise enough, already living deeply enough, and like there's no real reason to question or improve ourselves. <laughs> But is there a good reason? I'm still not hearing one. But as so often happens with the Dunning-Kruger effect, all of that turns out to be a complete illusion. And at that point, the healthiest thing for us would be to experience a catastrophic moment of disillusionment, a moment that would doubtlessly feel like a disaster, but that would actually herald a new and much wiser relation to life. Basically, a moment when humility can start to eclipse our habitual self-importance. A moment when we can let go of a lot of our excess egoistic baggage and start to be a little bit more realistic about how small we really are in comparison to the incomprehensible vastness that surrounds us. But of course, that too is fraught with a degree of paradox, especially since <laughs> we're not usually humble enough to recognize that we're not humble enough. <laughs> so those are what I see as four important obstacles to developing wisdom. That's the problem I'm having, though. I feel like one of the ways I know I'm not important to and, and I humble myself through that self-importance is having like healthy nihilism, but not nihilism. Like, again, to say that there's a purpose to me, I am the great and wise Brittany and I just need to be self-actualized and this is my destiny. It's like, well, OK, like that feels self-important, like to say that your life as a human is meant to seek wisdom in a profound way that makes you wiser than, you know, the average is self-important. Like when I said like people can be fives, I still don't think fives are wise because they're fives. Like I don't think I'm wise in the way that I'm seeking wisdom. So I'm not sure that kind of messes with my brain a little bit. You know what I mean? That kind of like that doesn't work with my brain a little bit because I, I have this conversation with some people in my life where they will they do think they're important and I think that's reasonable because I think in their head they're doing like really important things. But I think everything we do is only important because we've decided it's important and therefore it's about self-importance. But knowing that is what I think helps keep me humble because again, if you think you're doing something really important for humanity or really important, then that is about self-importance. It's not about humanity. Um but if you know you're really just doing it for yourself, like I think we all are, and that's maybe my idea of the world, maybe that's my belief, my bubble, is that it's like, it's, you know what I'm saying? That feels more humble to me. Um, but I'm not sure. Salty Doggo says he's just outlining Buddhist philosophy. Mm. Hassan says, oh, Brittany, you should vlog your trip to Europe. It would be cool to see traveling to Europe. Actually, I'm very open to that. I'm working on putting out content, especially for my members of like vlogs and stuff since I'm not a vlog channel. So I thought I would vlog for the members my move to Europe um, since I'm going to be open about where I'm going once I'm there. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, definitely an option. I'm pretty excited about that idea. I definitely want to show more of my home life, I think, through vlogs. Um, like just me though, like not my partner. Um, I don't think he's going to consent to that, but just like cooking at home or doing like, Hey guys, I'm editing a podcast and like, you know, something like that, but that will be for members. I'm trying to figure out BTS stuff. And learning to live more <laughs> along life's depth dimension. 
The first would be our habitual cultural practices. The second would be the effects of institutionalized power. The third would be wisdom's paradoxical nature. And the fourth would be our addiction to our own self-importance. <laughs> of course, that's hardly a comprehensive list, but it should at least provide a few inroads into understanding some of the problems we're facing as we attempt to negotiate the evolutionary passage from addiction to wisdom. So, at this point, since we're on the edge of talking about possible prescriptive suggestions, let's just dive into that. First, in addition to cultivating humility as a corrective to our runaway self-importance, which would be prescriptive suggestion number one, I'd like to suggest developing two more interrelated capacities, self-awareness and courage. Mm. Let's look at self-awareness mm. first. If he pulls a fucking Gryffindor right now about courage, these Gryffindors and their self-congratulatory, I'm the hero in the story, I'm not projecting this onto him, I could be wrong, but if he brings up Gryffindor, Gryffindor philosophy right now, bro. Which I'd say is itself prone to a measure of paradox, <laughs> especially since it would take self-awareness to recognize that we need to develop self-awareness. But, <coughs> excuse me. Um, area, 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 Averly? Girl, how do I say your name? The Four Noble Truths. They are the truth of suffering, the truth of the cause of suffering, the truth of the end of suffering, and the truth of the path that leads to the end of suffering. Fun. Despite that, I'd say that it's definitely worthwhile to find a way of actively practicing and cultivating. Sorry, Deanne says, am I the only one who can't follow his language? Honestly, I just have to translate it in my head. I actually am actively translating it because um, he talks very specifically. But yeah, I'm, I'm translating it. In my head, he talks very specifically. So you have to hop into like his way of thinking and then try to realize like what words in your vocabulary or what words he's using. Evading it, perhaps out of sheer curiosity, if nothing else. And uh, as I like to say so often in these videos, for me personally, meditation has proven to be a wonderful way of doing that. Same. But if meditation isn't your cup of tea, well, mm. there are certainly other ways creative experience, prayer and religious devotion, physical activity, who knows how many there are. Okay, but the important that. thing is to find at least one way of practicing self-awareness, not only for our own personal benefit, but for the rest of humanity too, and perhaps even for the universe as a whole. Totally. Because at the end of the day, perhaps the universe is trying to become conscious of itself through us, that we are the universe becoming conscious of itself. However, it's also important to recognize that development. Hold on, Indiana Jones wants to come in. Knock the fucking door. Huh? Hello! Where have you been all day? Have you been out? Where have you been all day? Were you sleeping? Oh, she wants her food and water. Oh my gosh. What? Okay. Beep, beep, boop, boop, beep, boop, boop. Developing self-awareness isn't necessarily an easy thing. In fact, it's usually... See, I don't, again, that whole like, we're the universe, you're the universe. Yeah, yeah. I am you and you're in me and I could have been you and you could have been me. But like, you know, we weren't and I'm not. But also, like, the universe, I think, is indifferent. I Okay, this is my belief. But I, I don't, like, I just think the universe exists. Like, we exist. Like, space and stars and all these things. And it's not deep and no one's looking for anyone and no one's trying to be anybody and there's no one to prove yourself to. <sighs> Usually just the opposite. The reason is that we pretty much all engage in self-deception in various ways and to varying That's degrees. True. We're pretty much all great actors, great pretenders and great liars too. Most of all to ourselves. And the very first lie we usually tell ourselves is, I'm not lying to myself. And while that may sound harsh, in reality, there's no reason to feel ashamed of it or morally indignant about it. It's really nothing more than life. Life wending its tricky, circuitous way through us. But at the same time, that's also why cultivating self-awareness takes a fair amount of courage. Because as Nietzsche once
Ah, uh, it's like the word eerie, but pronounced like era. Oh, era. That's a great name. Um, so again, I think this is really, really helpful for a lot of people, but this doesn't make sense. Like it makes sense to my brain, but I don't like it. It sounds too woo woo and way too self-important. Like the whole thing just sounds too like it's too poetic and I'm not that kind of a brain. Like my brain's pretty pragmatic and I don't th- I I can I can. When I'm sitting with my partner, guys, and I look at him and I think we are the best couple. No one is more in love than us. That feels like this. Where you're playing a version of your reality into your brain through feeling and poetry. Like I have this life. Look how magical my life is. Look how profound I am. But in some real way, there is absolutely nothing profound about the fact that we exist. It's we're just here. So my brain doesn't quite like it, but I understand it. And I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying it's like, you know what I mean? It's a lot. It's a lot of poetry for my ears, but I get it. Like people, I just don't need to trick myself into thinking my life is like profound to enjoy everything about life. I, you know what I'm saying? Like, I think us existing is really cool. I'm glad I'm the sperm who made it, you know, but like. Eh. Once famously observed. Even the most courageous among us only rarely has enough courage to face what he really knows. That's from Twilight of the Idols, by the way. In other words, being honest with ourselves requires courage because it means dropping our usual egoistic investments and self-importance and stepping beyond our comfort zones and safe spaces. It requires... It requires becoming dangerous to ourselves and courting catastrophe as if it were one of life's great passions. Totally. You yeah, I I yeah. So you do things that challenge yourself and put you in situations where you have to like face different versions of yourself. It's like very yes, but you can make it like really profound. Like I know I felt that way in my 20s. I thought BDSM was like the most profound thing I'd ever done. And it was at the time, but it wasn't really Right. What was profound was how I was using the tool of BDSM, but not BDSM itself, like BDSM itself. Like I remember like watching Flagrant and Andrew Scholes going to Burning Man. He's like, this is fucking profound, but it's not Burning Man. That's profound. It's the action Andrew took to pop his bubble. That's pretty profound. Right. But, you know, basically, it means adopting a fundamentally adventurous posture toward life where any moment might bring us into the howling gale of sudden transformation, because very few things in this world are as dangerous or as adventurous as honesty and learning to call things by their proper names. And while that may seem like a daunting task, as Confucius once noted, it's also the beginning of all wisdom. So I guess that those would be my three prescriptive suggestions for developing more wisdom and learning to live more in life's depth dimension. First, cultivating humility is a corrective to our self-importance. Second, developing self-awareness. And finally, developing enough courage to see the process through. But, but beyond all of that, maybe it would help to bring wisdom and the depth of life into the ambit of our prevailing linguistic practices. To start talking about them, at least now and then, as if they're things that actually matter. Perhaps even more than the Kardashians' asses. <laughs> that sounds crazy. <laughs> I know, right? And actually, full disclosure, that's part of why I'm making this video. To take at least one small step in that direction. Anyhow, <laughs> thanks as always thanks. for taking the time to listen. I appreciate your attention and I appreciate your presence in this world. Hmm. I guess at this point, I'd also like to take a few seconds to apologize for not posting any videos for, for what? Almost a year, I think. Yeah, okay, so I think overall, pretty great video. I think people, this is definitely helpful. Um. I don't much love the version of his relationship with actualization, but I appreciate it. And I think this is some people's relationship with it. And I think that's important. Okay. I'm going to switch to calls for a bit. And then um, if I have the spoons, we'll watch a couple more videos, but no guarantees.
Um, it is interesting. Yeah. Like the way he conveys his ideas. I'm going to watch another video he has. Um, which other video of his did I want to watch? Oh, his beliefs, what he believes, which I think would be much more insightful into understanding his perspective. Maybe we'll do calls and maybe we'll even watch that one because he has a video literally like, what do I believe? Which is very interesting because I wonder if he's going to specify the differences between knowing and believing. Okay. To the Discord. Stuck in my head in real life while I'm dead. My belly's being fed and I'm okay. I'm just fine. Yet all I do is whine. Not to you in my mind because I know I don't make sense. I've been nothing but blessed. So why's my life a mess? Please tell me because I'm sick of thinking. Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Then 